Hey, everybody. Welcome to the morning market briefing. Don't cut that when we edit it. It's just how we roll. Uh, Thursday, February 23rd, 2023, 22323, for those uh, right and short dates. Uh, Tom, let's jump in. Lots of news from the Fed. Yeah, so we got the minutes yesterday from their previous meeting. Uh, and I'll be honest, I thought it was a little dovish. I thought everyone had baked in the expectation that rates were going to continue to go higher. Uh, I think that the the big takeaway that people were focusing on is there was a paragraph in there that basically said the Fed didn't think they were going to reach 2% inflation until 2025, uh, which would make sense. I mean, I think it's going to be a lot stickier than people were thinking. And I think that's the hawkish uh, sort of foothold that people have attached to, in my opinion, from the minutes. Otherwise, I would say it's pretty much in line. Uh, there was a, a paragraph in there that said that, quote, a few uh, participants thought that they should have done a 50 basis point rate hike, but it seems that 25 basis points was more of the consensus. And I think that that's probably the way it's going to continue. I think there would be a particularly high bar uh, of very strong economic data that would have to come out to uh, push them to a place where they would have to do 50 basis point rate hikes. Uh, but I think that, you know, the market now is saying, there's a hundred percent chance we get three hikes. In fact, we're over three hikes now. It's like 3.03 as of this morning. So there is a little bit of, of doubt creeping in the market that potentially the three is not going to be the end. And as a result, we saw, you know, we were up maybe call it 30 basis points beforehand. We saw the market ultimately close down after the uh after the meeting minutes were released. And I didn't think they were that bad. I think there's a little bit of a stretch there for the market thinking they were exceptionally bad uh, or exceptionally hawkish. But uh, don't tell that to people on CNBC. You know, they were pumping the the Fed's ultra hawkish narrative all afternoon, which probably didn't help. No, it didn't help. And I, I have a hard time separating the 2025 time frame for reaching the inflation target from the fact that they're moving slower. I think those things kind of go lock lockstep. Yeah. And in some regards, I think that extended timetable to get inflation where they want it is indicative of the pace at which they intend to raise rates from this point forward. Yeah, I think they're, they're basically broadcasting that we're going to get rates to a level we feel comfortable with, whether that's 5%, 5.5%, 6%, even 6.5%. And then they're just going to leave it there. You know, they're going to get that rate above the rate of inflation. Uh, and, you know, it basically is going to slow the car down more slowly rather than just say, hey, we're just going to stop this thing on a dime, uh, which is initially what they did. So, you know, think of it as approaching a stoplight. First, you hit the brakes harder, and then you kind of coast a little bit, and you slowly uh, come to a stop. So I think that's kind of the approach they're taking there. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a perfect illustration. We can slam on the brakes, and we can be done with this pretty quick. But it's, you know, we're going to get a little whiplash yeah. along the way, or we can just say, hey, we got some time. We're going to slow this thing down. Uh, continued news on the front of Lyle Brainerd, uh, who has been named by Biden to the White House National Economic Council uh, as director uh she will uh, be replaced from the Fed. Who are we looking for uh, to kind of take take that spot? So there are two candidates that have been officially named. Uh, the first one is a Harvard economics professor named Karen Dinan, and the other is a, a woman named Janice Everly, who is a finance professor at Northwestern. Uh, so they both previously back to back served uh, as chief treasury economic or ec, uh, chief treasury economist under the Obama administration, so Everly went first from 2011 to 2013, and she was then followed by Dinan uh, from 2014 to 2017. So they're both highly regarded at the treasury. They're both very tight with Janet Yellen, uh, and they both have a Keynesian uh, tilt, which is essentially uh, in the in the economic house of Janet Yellen, which is that. Government intervention, government spending is a very big piece of the economy as opposed to, you know, classic economics, which would be, you know, the market corrects itself, more of a laissez-faire uh, approach to economics. Uh, they're a little bit different in terms of background. Dinan is very much your blue blood economist. She's from Connecticut. She teaches at Harvard. She went to Brown. She went to Harvard. Uh, you know, very much a blue blood economist in the traditional sense. Everly is a little bit different. She's from California. She grew up on a farm. Uh, she was heavy in the uh, future farm farmers of America. Um, she went to UC Davis, I believe, and then got her PhD at MIT in economics. So definitely not a slouch, but a little bit more uh, of a, you know, 
blue collar yeah, blue collar yeah more more approachable uh a blue collar economist you know sort of uh background my expectation would probably be uh for everly you know you're basically getting lyle brainerd who is pretty much the same as dining uh leaving you know she's gonna be heading up the economic council so move somebody in who's a little bit more you know has more of a midwest west tilt uh you know northwestern obviously being in chicago uh you know kind of checking that box i think is probably where they'll go if i had to guess uh but obviously two really strong candidates they're very much in the uh in the camp of what the uh uh, the the Fed is looking to do and what the Treasury is looking to do with Janet Yellen. So I think that either one would be a good fit. I think both of them are probably uh, excellent candidates. But my if I had to pick one, I'd probably say Everly uh, is going to take over. Yeah, just from a profile standpoint, kind of makes sense. Seems seems consistent with the trajectory. Yep. Uh, Nvidia really really strong move uh, after reporting earnings up about eleven percent right now in pre market trading. Uh, earnings per share came in solid at 88 cents. Expectation was somewhere kind of around 80, 81 cents. Revenue came in a little hotter than expected. But the biggest thing is probably much more so on the guidance side. Everybody is looking to see when the cycle has bottomed out and we, when we will see improvement. Uh, they are guiding for earnings per share kind of in an interpolated fashion of something between 89 cents and 95 cents versus a previous estimate of 82 cents. Uh, they expect sequential revenue growth in each of their platforms led by gaming and data center. Uh, they expect data center to grow uh, year over year with an acceleration throughout the year. Gross margin came in very, very strong, uh, you know, expected to be close to 67% previous expectation around 65. Uh, all in all, uh, a very, very strong quarter for NVIDIA. And interestingly, artificial intelligence, a big part of their commentary, uh, was referenced uh, 75 times on their conference calls, more than Google, Meta, Microsoft, a uh, whole lot more than Apple, Amazon didn't even mention it. Uh, so kind of interesting to see uh, that seems to be the buzzword right now. And NVIDIA certainly seems to be leaning into it. Uh, but a huge quarter. I don't know if you have takeaways. Yeah, I think it's interesting that NVIDIA continues to be, I would say, the most agile chip company because when Bitcoin was hot, NVIDIA positioned themselves as the best chips to uh, mine for Bitcoin. When the metaverse was hot, you know, they came out with their uh, Omniverse uh, idea, which is they were going to have all kinds of artificial intelligence based uh, services. And then now that, you know, the metaverse has sort of shifted into this chat GPT, chat AI situation and where you know where's nvidia they're front and center saying hey we're going to be the best at this with our chips as well so being an advanced chip maker uh that can accurately or at least effectively message that you are dead center in whatever is the uh the hot buzzword du jour is nvidia's uh uh way of operating and they they seem to have crushed it again uh you know they also announced a 10-year partnership with microsoft on their PC gaming chips, uh, which is big. So, you know, obviously Microsoft's a huge player still in that space uh, and being attached and, and plugged in to all of their, uh, their gaming computers is going to be a big one too for the foreseeable future. Yeah, this is the kind of stock that really can have uh, kind of a broader impact on a whole industry. Chip companies, I would expect to perform quite well today. Futures, uh, by and large, on an index level are up around half a percent. Again, NVIDIA up 11. I just pulled up Micron a minute ago, up about 3%. Uh, so probably going to be uh, pretty bullish for the entire sector uh, as we go into trading regular trading hours on Thursday. Uh, meanwhile, Apple uh, is really kind of flexing a little bit on the medical side. Uh, they've had this technology that they're using that can check uh, your glucose levels without having the continuous prick that several products that have that and monitor that uh, require. Uh, and they're seeing very, very promising results on this. Uh, could be a subscription service that they add on uh, to many of their Apple health products uh, through various means would be very, very high margin uh, if they do pursue that. We're still probably several years out, but we've talked about Apple health through this kind of hypothetical, imagine the data they could use, imagine what they could do with their wearables and other technology. Uh, arguably the first impact where we see something that potentially addresses uh, or presents a better mousetrap. Uh, in some ways. I mean, there's so much data that you get from an Apple Watch. You know, you have one, I have one. You know, there's fall detection. There's, you know... Loud noise. Detection. Yeah, loud noise, oxygen readings, all that kind of stuff. But uh, to have something that actually addresses 
and replaces another product potentially in a less invasive way with a high degree of accuracy uh, is true innovation in a lot of ways. Yeah, I'm interested to see how this goes. Uh, I've looked at these continuous glucose monitors before, uh, just sort of in the uh, self-experimentation kind of thing, because basically what they have now, Dexcom and Abbott have some where you basically stick it on the back of your arm and it, you can have an app and it'll tell you exactly what your blood sugar is, what your insulin resistance levels are, that kind of stuff, which I think it just would be interesting to see how you're affected by different foods and things uh, in terms of your uh, glycemic reaction. Uh, but they are super expensive. I've never actually done it because they're about 300 bucks. Uh, the Abbott one is cheaper, but you have to have a prescription for it because it's actually for diabetes use. Uh, Dexcom is uh, has a, a product where you can actually just buy one retail, but it's like for two weeks of glucose monitoring, it's like 300 bucks, uh, you know, and then you got to get another one. And then it's like, you know, it becomes a subscription that's really, really expensive. You might as well just do steroids uh, for that for that price point. But this would be interesting. I mean, if it's a piece they can just stick in the Apple Watch, you know, you can kind of have a real time understanding of, you know, maybe drinking 10 Cokes a day is affecting your health uh, will be interesting. But you know, you, it makes you wonder what else has Apple got up their sleeve that they're working on that you just don't even know about. Because it doesn't really seem like it's in their ecosystem. But then once you start thinking about watch integration and potential subscription services and stuff, I mean, you know, the AirPods, you know, as a standalone company would be one of the biggest companies in the world. So if you can get another product that could stand up and do, you know, multi-million or multi-billion dollars in revenue a year, uh, you know, and disrupt the space that you don't even think about as being a tech space would be interesting. Uh, last thing for today, Bath and Body Works. This is not Bed Bath and Beyond. Uh, Bath and Body Works getting an activist investor, Dan Loeb of Third Point, uh, is coming in. He's identified numerous issues, uh, specifically wants to improve the executive compensation plan, succession planning, uh, capital allocation, investor communication, and strategy. So a lot of kind of corporate upper management speak for we got to clean things up. Uh, and it seems at this point uh, that Bath and Body Works management is engaging. Uh, they they seem interested in pursuing some help. This is a company that's been uh, in pretty rough shape. I mean, earnings were very, very strong as recently as two years ago. Uh, but now we're trading at a very low multiple on very beat up earnings potential. Uh, and so they need some help. Uh, good move, bad move. Think they can right this ship? I mean, I think it's ultimately going to be a private equity target, right? They're going to get in there. They're going to cut as much fat as they can and try and sell it off. Maybe even do a bigger company. Uh, I mean, Bath and Body Works to me makes me think of being like 15 and hanging out at the mall. Like that was a very hot store. So much dope, man. And there's so many flavors. You walk yeah. in there and it's just, the aromas are overwhelming. Yeah. It was like, there, I feel like there was a spray that was very popular among like 15 year old girls when I was in eighth grade that was like, you got to get XYZ spray and, Bath and Body Works. So that's what every eighth grade classroom smelled like for two years. It was female uh, Axe Body yeah, Spray. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In the year in the year 1999, that's what uh, what classrooms smelled like in middle schools because bad, bad, yeah, Bath and Body Works was so hot. But I mean, I don't know anyone who's just hanging out at the mall looking for uh, hand soaps and and sprays. Yeah, right it's now. a really it's a shockingly narrow business. Yeah, when you think about <laughs> it, like, and you think of getting rolled into something larger. I mean. You know, you don't see a lot of standalone soap companies, which yeah. is essentially what they are. I yeah. mean, they have various products of soap, maybe some candles, but it's a yeah, it's a worse version of Yankee Candle Company. Yeah. <laughs> like Yankee Candle Company, like people pay up for those. People it's, like a nice yeah, like Yankee candle. candles, but they're liquid. Yeah, yeah. And you rub them on your hands. Yeah, yeah. Um, they have all the weird soaps that have like sparkles and stuff in the bottles. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's just please pieces of plastic. It's probably horrible for the environment. It's got it. And you're <laughs> and probably horrible for your skin. I yeah, don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, you know. I don't know anything about this stuff, but it, it seems very odd. It'll be interesting to see. Uh, I mean, I do think we're going to continue to see a theme of activists and private equity folks coming in trying to rectify distressed businesses. And I think this is just another example of that. Uh, I don't find it particularly intriguing from an investment thesis perspective. Seems in a lot of ways like an odd use of capital uh, for Loeb and Third Point, but what do I know? I mean, that guy's pretty smart. Yeah, they probably yeah they probably have identified some some opportunities to to cut costs and you know make a return on their investment. It just doesn't seem like one that you know uh, we're not interested in turnaround stories. We're interested in strong companies. But it is interesting to I mean, you wonder why anyone would buy this, but it was a major news point this morning. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, we will wrap it up there. We'll be back tomorrow morning at eight thirty. Uh, talk to you guys soon.